Hello, my name is Brett Lazendi. I'm a structural engineer in San Francisco, and I was the co-leader of the uh, ERI reconnaissance team that visited Nepal after the April 25th earthquake and, and the major aftershocks that occurred. Uh, I'll be talking about selected topics uh, with regard to how buildings performed in the earthquake. Uh, this is uh, the second part of a building-focused presentation. Dr. Hema Kaushik uh, has a, a separate presentation that focuses on reinforced concrete frame buildings with masonry infill. I'll be talking instead about URM bearing wall buildings, about evaluating buildings for safety after earthquakes, a couple of uh, slides on barricades and shoring issues, and I'll wrap up with school retrofits. ERI has put together a series of briefing videos that are multidisciplinary and, and look at the earthquake uh, from all of the, the many different team member perspectives. So you can see it's a long list, and I would encourage those of you who are interested to, to take a look at, at some of these presentations. We hope they're exciting and, and informative for you. Uh, with respect to URM buildings, um, I'd like to set the stage a little bit about the kinds of buildings that, that we observed in the uh, areas we visited, which were the heavily shaken areas uh, around the Kathmandu Valley and, and in the districts adjacent to Kathmandu. Um, we tended to see one to four story buildings. There were a few that were taller. Uh, they, they are typically rectangular in shape, uh, have offices, uh, people live above them, and they're usually stores on the ground story. One of the somewhat unique things that I saw, at least in my experience from other parts of the world, is that uh, because there is storefronts on the ground, uh, the doors and windows that provide access to those facilities were done entirely in wood frame in many buildings. So you had the kind of unusual uh, experience of seeing masonry uh, stories and walls two, three stories tall being supported entirely by wood frame construction. It's usually only on the front facade, though, where that entrance uh, access is needed. There are uh, a small number of very large, very beautiful, impressive monumental buildings for palaces and uh, schools, things like that, in some of the larger cities. But th that won't be the focus of what I'm talking about today. So in terms of how these buildings are put together, um, this, this photograph on the right gives you a feel. Uh, the, the roof, which has collapsed, uh, in this case, was corrugated metal. We also saw wood roof. They're supported by wood joists uh, that hold up sheathing. Um, the floor is very similar, but it usually has an added aspect of mud and, and sometimes straw and other materials to insulate it and, and uh, provide a walking surface. Uh, the walls, we saw brick buildings, we saw stone buildings, we saw combinations of those buildings. I know there are adobe buildings in Nepal, but, but we did not visit those areas. Uh, many of the buildings, particularly in rural areas, have mud mortar. Um, some have lime uh, added to this. Uh, some of the more modern ones have cement mortar. You can see from the picture that the Ys of the buildings are not well connected in many cases. They, they lack header courses or effective header courses and tend to uh, lead to delamination. Uh, stone and brick uh, form foundations. We did not tend to see concrete foundations in any of these buildings. Um, so in, in terms of general categories of damage, it's very similar to what we've seen around the world in, in past earthquakes, sadly. Um, this, this kind of building stock has a poor track record of performance, and, and uh, unfortunately that continued in this event, uh, particularly in the very heavily shaken areas. Uh, we tend to see parapet damage as, as the first thing to occur in, in URM buildings, and there aren't a lot of parapets that, that I observed in Nepal. It's just not a basic feature of the building stock, but here is one example of that, and that's on the left where that's continued down into delaminating of the outer wires, which is now on the ground. Um, on the right, in, in another part of the country, this is a stone building where uh, the outer wires had fallen. Uh, Delamination tended to occur uh, in, in mud mortar buildings and in stone buildings more than others. Um, obviously, you know, we saw plenty of examples of in-plane cracking of loads parallel to the wall, uh, either from diagonal tension, from bed joint sliding, from rocking, from toe crushing. You know, the, the middle picture there is a, um, a pier that has a lot of axial load on it, and you can see uh, it's got a significantly different look than the others. The, the building on the right has cracks going through the spandrels in the circles, very common occurrence. 
and the bottom story is, is leaning significantly and begun to rack. You don't tend to see that. Usually things, they either fall or they come back to rest vertically, but we saw a number of uh, racking buildings like this. Um, however, the bulk of what we saw, particularly in the heavily shaken areas, are pictures that look like this, uh, where the walls have fallen out of plane perpendicular to their length, and, and this is due to many, uh, many issues. There are poor uh, roof-to-wall ties, floor-to-wall ties. There's in-plane cracking that's exacerbated out-of-plane performance. The building walls themselves have a difficulty spanning between floors. And so this can be small pieces of the wall, typically at mid-span of a diaphragm, uh, or it can you know, continue to grow like the picture on the upper left and, and become extensive. Uh, in uh, farther east, uh, in the country where we see more stone buildings, you see similar types of behavior like these images show. Um, we also saw plenty of examples of corner damage. It's a very common occurrence in URM buildings. It's where um, damage tends to begin at the upper stories, at, at uh, corners, and then grow. Uh, so the upper left and the upper right photograph show the beginning, and, and the middle photograph shows you know, more extensive damage, and more uh, threat to pedestrians on the street, and ultimately to people living inside the buildings as well. Um, we saw some evidence of, of roof to wall damage and you know collapse or partial collapse of the roof itself, and yet the rest of the building was still standing. Damage tends to, to propagate from the top down in, in many of these buildings, and so this is sort of an example of that. Ultimately, um, you get to partial and total collapse uh, views, uh, unfortunately, and, and so there are many, many examples of, of towns and communities or, or portions of communities that look just like this. Um, in the upper right, interestingly, you can see those wood frame storefront still standing, and, and yet it's the masonry above that has uh, taken a three-story building down to one story. So typically in these kinds of earthquakes, we don't um, get an opportunity due to time constraints to do uh, any detailed or quantitative efforts. We're tending to look at, at the big picture and, and get impressions and observations, and then later people look in more detail. But we did take the opportunity to try and do a bit of a, a middle ground effort in the community of Chatara. This is in the Sindal Palchak district, um, about three to four hours northeast of Kathmandu. It's on a mountain ridge. Um, there's a long street. It's, it's, a, it's a district headquarters, so it's a fairly large city. Uh, so maybe three, four kilometers of a road uh, exists where there's significant damage. We walked a kilometer of that road, looked at 150 buildings, and we recorded uh, what kind of building there was. Uh, was it a uh, RC frame building like this one, or was it a bearing wall building like I've showed you? Um, was it demolished? Um, had it collapsed, but they haven't demolished and carried it away yet? Uh, it, did it have a tagging status? All the buildings on the streets um, had had been tagged, uh, for the most part, with either a red, yellow, or green spray-painted dot indicating their post-earthquake safety evaluation status. And in a few cases, they were so badly damaged, there was no need to paint them. We also recorded whether they were on flat ground or whether they were on sloped ground. And then we combined the results of that effort into the very heavily damaged buildings that were either collapsed, collapsed and demolished, or, or had not collapsed, but they were tagged red as unsafe. And, uh, you know, 87%, so a very, very large percentage of the masonry bearing wall buildings uh, fell, unfortunately, in that category. But about half of the RC frames buildings did. And we tended to see a larger evidence of damage in the severe category on the buildings that were sloping on a downhill side of the street. Uh, so the next topic uh, is post-earthquake safety evaluations, uh, you know, evaluating buildings of whether uh, it's deemed acceptable to go back in or whether we would like people to stay out. And that was obviously important to the people who live there and it was important to us on the team as we were planning our effort. We wanted to stay in locations, if possible, that were as, as safe as they could be. And so, um, you know, one test is whether they have been evaluated and tagged and, and this particular hotel had, uh, we understood. Um, 
it had also been evaluated by our colleagues uh, who were engineers at, at NSAID in Nepal, and and they had pointed out that it was essentially unscathed and it had survived both the main shock and aftershocks quite well. When I went there and checked in, I discovered that the green tag, at least the one they were posting on the front desk uh, as a stamp of approval, was actually done by the Department of Tourism. So I, I'm not sure that is the way that we would want to, it to be done, but nonetheless, uh, that was what happened in this particular hotel. Uh, so from the Botter picture, uh, it's an amazing effort of what uh, the people were able to do in Nepal. At the time we were there, uh, several weeks after the event, as many as 60,000 evaluations had been done, more have been done since. There are many organizations involved. The, the major one was the Nepal Engineers Association. Um, they had coordinated uh, the efforts, they had trained engineers, they had held seminars, um, but there were many other groups too. So uh, we discovered some you know, buildings had been looked at by multiple groups, some by multiple teams from the same organization. So compiling, tracking, checking all these uh, efforts for quality, we know from past uh, efforts that that's challenging. Um, we know that, uh, very interestingly, only government buildings um, were intended to receive a tag. So that's very different than how this has been implemented in, in many other uh, earthquakes. But we understood the evaluators who were doing this had spent a significant amount of time talking with the people that, that they met, uh, telling them what their findings were. Uh, so in terms of you know what we observed when we were there in, in the form of tagging, uh, the spray-painted dots that I was mentioning, there's a tilted RC frame building that's received a fairly obvious red tag. Uh, the building next to it that's still vertical has has damage, uh, got a yellow tag. Uh, we saw on a few buildings, the government buildings uh, for the most part, uh, the traditional red tag saying it's unsafe, don't enter. Um, the Department of Education is responsible for schools, uh, created these beautiful tags that you see in the bottom left there. This is a undamaged green tag building. They had a, uh, an equally beautiful red tag uh, as well, um, so we saw those. Um, so despite how tagging has traditionally been implemented where uh, it's you know been created on a mandatory format in, in other countries and the language on the placards is mandatory, in, in Nepal we found that it was typically uh, implemented, shall we say, from a voluntary point of view. So as some examples, on the bottom left is a very badly damaged building. People had vacated it. It would be somewhat challenging and, and uh, scary to live in that building, obviously. So that was evacuated. However, the one in the middle, which is doesn't look all that badly damaged from this side, it has damage on the other side, um, and was red tagged as is still occupied. The store is still running. Uh, the people were there. And uh, we understood that in many cases this was happening during the day, but because of uh, their con the residents' concern, they were not sleeping in the stories above at night. They were actually living and, and sleeping in other areas they felt were safer. Uh, we did see uh, an example of a collection of damaged apartment buildings in Deposse, the bottom right photo. These are tall, high-rise buildings that were quite badly damaged, um, where the unsafe tag was posted and it, it said, you know, entry to the site is strictly prohibited. This was being enforced by guards. Um, that was very unique. We did not, I did not see that in other locations. Um, the yellow tag has evolved over time in, in U.S. practice and in other countries. Um, originally it was called limited entry. It's now called restricted use. Um, and the idea in the U.S. is that uh, certain areas of the building are restricted. They're the ones that are in danger from a chimney, a parapet, uh, some form of damage, but the other areas are, are okay to occupy. That is different from how we observed it being implemented in Nepal where, um, it, as you can see in the description from their guidelines, uh, entry is only for emergency purposes at your own risk. Don't occupy it on a continuous basis. The public's not supposed to go in. And that was intended to apply to the whole building. Uh, you can see in the photograph on the left, despite being yellow tagged, the public can certainly go in here and it's being occupied. Um, so this was also voluntarily implemented. Um, there are uh, nice forms for rapid and detailed evaluations in, in the Nepal guidelines. Here's an example. There are these very helpful images that are also in the guideline, you know, giving you examples and recommended 
tags so that you can look at similar situations in the field. Um, I thought that was a very nice feature. Um, the detailed evaluations in Nepal are very different ones. Um, there are uh, damage grades that are given rather than tags, and the damage grades are linked to uh, ultimate recommended status of the building, whether it should be repaired, strengthened, or demolished. Um, so that's quite different than what we have done in other locations where the detailed tag does not do that very deliberately and uh, and simply is intended to represent the, the red, yellow, green recommendation about occupancy. Um, we were told by many of the people who did this that, that they would have liked to have more specific information, particularly in the middle damage grade categories, to help them. Um, barricades um, were not widely observed. In fact, the only one that I saw uh, was in Kathmandu's downtown Darbar Square, which is where the main uh, key World Heritage sites are, like the one on the right. So you can see the, the yellow rope and the, and the pedestrian traffic has been directed as far to the left as possible. Um, in some countries, guidelines have been developed. Uh, the U.S. has a, an informal guideline standard um, where they would like the barricade distance to be at least one and a half times the potential falling height of, of the building that's threatening the street. Uh, you can see that that's a challenging thing to do in any place uh, all around the world, and it's certainly uh, more than challenging. It would be impossible to do in, in most of Nepal because of the, the size of the streets. Um, but it wasn't being done at all in most places. Um, people were driving, walking right in front of buildings that could fall in future aftershocks because they had little choice. I mean, this is about the only way to get from point A to point B in many places. Uh, shoring was observed by the time we were there and in lots of cities and communities. Uh, it tended to look like this. Um, so uh, the wood posts that are, you know, maybe they have a spike into the ground, uh, like the bottom right picture. So our feeling was, um, that this would probably have somewhat limited effectiveness. And in fact, you begin to wonder at some point whether the building is actually supporting the shoring rather than, than the reverse. Uh, last topic I wanted to go over is school retrofitting. Um, Nepal uh, has retrofitted about 250 schools at this point. Um, we were told that the performance of these buildings was quite good. I have not seen statistics uh, that sort of quantify that, but that certainly was what we heard from many people. We visited several uh, locations. Uh, it's run by um, the government's Department of Education, but it was developed by NSET, which is an uh, NGO, uh, earthquake technology uh, folks in Nepal. Um, the work is done by private consultants, but DOE uh, plan checks the drawings and calculations, which is very impressive. Um, buildings are typically done occupied, but not but not in every case. And when they're occupied, they do them wing by wing. They move the students out in under tents in some cases. Uh, training is involved, so the contractors and the masons who do the work you know, they have gone through a program and, and, and are schooled in the particular techniques that are done. Um, so the first school building to be retrofitted in Nepal back in 2000 is the upper left photo here. This is in uh, community. Uh, couple hours east of, of uh, Kathmandu. And you can see um, the vertical and horizontal banding that is a thin layer of con reinforced concrete, both on the outside and the inside. And it's dowelled through to, uh, to strengthen the walls and, and tie them together for in-plane and out-of-plane work. Um, the bottom right photo shows the, the mason who was in charge of doing this work. Um, and uh, he, interestingly, that that shot in the background is, is part of the town. Uh, we are told that this is a village that is uh, is uh, comprised of many masons. Um, so it, it's sort of famous in the area for uh, where all the skilled masons live. And so uh, he built his own home, of course, uh, with the help of his colleagues. And when he built it, he built it with the improved technology that he learned through the training that he went through for the retrofit program. And, and he has become a, a well-spoken advocate for improved earthquake technology. And, and so he advocated for the upper right uh, 
building when they built when they needed a new school uh, to expand into that was built with uh, the, band, the gray banding and other techniques that made it uh, a better, more resistant building than they would typically do. So it was a very powerful and moving story of, of how effective um, capacity building and, and implementation can be if done well. Um, technically, the, the retrofitting, as I mentioned, involves banding typically um, and, and then tying the bands through the wall. Um, the roofs, diaphragms uh, in many of these buildings, corrugated metal or wood, are not very effective and we did not see strengthening of that. So I have questions about how effective that would be. But the rooms tend to be small and they were relying on cantilever action of the banding and some of the tying together. Um, it, there's a lot of effort involved in, in trying to get these bands and form the edges. And so I began to wonder if it would just be more cost effective to just do an overlay. They, they certainly thought of this and, and it would be more material, so they have tended to go this route. But uh, I still wonder if that's not the, uh, I think both are, are viable approaches. Uh, they have consistently tried to um, put seismic joints and break buildings down to um, more s smaller uh, regular pieces. And in this case, apparently the contractor had not initially put the joint in, so they came back later and saw cut it out. Uh, this is not something we would tend to do here where we have such a uniform building and, and floor heights that align, um, but that is their practice there. So to summarize then, um, what we saw uh, with the bearing wall buildings is they tended, uh, in, in all the places we looked, to perform somewhat worse than the RC frame buildings. There was variable performance of the RC frames as well. Um, poor quality construction in the bearing walls and mud and mortar uh, performed noticeably worse. A uh, significant difference in my observation. Saw it, you know, typical damage mechanisms we've seen in other events. The, the, the real issue here, since there's been such a great loss of uh, housing is, is rebuilding that stock or repairing the ones that can be uh, upgraded and not uh, started over from scratch. Uh, evaluations, an extraordinary effort, but uh, an extraordinary task uh, as well of trying to coordinate and provide adequate quality assurance. Um, I'm somewhat concerned that the understanding and implementation of red and yellow tags, particularly without posting them on buildings, uh, may be challenging for the public to, to fully understand and perhaps even for some of the evaluators doing the work. I think providing more specificity and examples in the guidelines would only help. Uh, I think similarly guidelines and then more effective implementation of them on barricades and shoring would be beneficial. And I think the school retrofitting program is, is a wonderful story um, and there are many, many schools left, uh, we understand. So there, it's a, quite a grand task that's left, but hopefully that program will continue to grow. Um, so uh, just to wrap up here, if you're interested, you can pause and hear some sample references that I was referring to in the talk. Um, if you're looking for more information, ERI has a vast treasure trove of materials. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, virtual team collaborator, as we call them, Deepak Pont, um, who helped me um, document and upload and deal with the photographs that I collected as well as helped me with this presentation. Um, and then there are many other people who were involved in helping me and helping all the other ERI team members and staff, uh, in particular NSED and Nepal. Uh, and then in particular on some of the topics I've been talking about, I mentioned at the bottom of the screen there, some of the people I was able to talk with who were extremely gracious and helpful and I'd like to thank them as well. I uh, hope this has been interesting for me and I would encourage you to, to look at the other presentations when you have an opportunity. Thank you very much.